Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. But first, a word from our sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A district attorney learns that in every man's mind there is a secret compartment. It can be the hiding place for guilt or for fear. And fear is a deadly enemy of justice. Take this case. It started at one o'clock in the morning in the shadows of a waterfront pier. All right, start it up. Where'd you get this heap from, Crow? That's my business. Look, Slater, you just drive. Let me do the thinking. Uh, you do the thinking, I do the dirty work. Is that it? You want to keep working, Slater? You want to brass check it to Miles' shape up? All right, all right. If Rimlinger isn't straightened out, I'm going to be finished. And no stumble bummer like him is going to finish any crew. All right, turn down River Street. You'll be leaving the pier in two minutes. Suppose somebody sees us, Crow. Who's going to see us? He's the only longshoreman I got working on that dock tonight. He'll be coming out alone. Get him in the middle of the street. It's nice and wide. He'll have nothing to duck behind. Better slow down a little. All right. Now, be careful on this stretch. Hey, this thing's sliding all over. What do you think I told you to slow down? The oil truck turned over here last night. They put sand and gravel on it, but it's still slippery. Watch it now. Pier 37, just past the ferry shed. There's people in that ferry shed, Crow. They're not close enough to bother us. Watch the street. Hey, there. There he is now. Let him walk further into the street. Now, gun it. Hey, stop, Crow. To let you go by. Perfect. Cut into him. Keep going. Think we got him? We knocked him a hundred feet later. But the front of the car's all smashed. So what? I'll give the kid a hundred bucks to have it fixed. That's getting rid of Rimlinger pretty cheap. And the newspapers ain't gonna try to pin this one on any crow. I can see the headlines now. Longshoreman killed in hit and run accident. <laughs> <laughs> Keep in this office, Miss Miller. He's waiting for you, Harrington. Go right in. Hi, Chief. How'd you make out? Lab identified the hot rod we found at the Midtown Garage. It's the one, all right. Any line on the owner? Yeah. We picked him up. A newsboy, 16 years old. Name's Jimmy Leonard. I got him down to the detention room now. You want to see him? Yes. I'll be down in the detention room, Miss Miller. Yes, sir. What's the boy's background, Hank? He lives with his father. Cold water walk up on the east side. No trouble with the police before. As a matter of fact... What? He peddles his papers near the 9th Precinct house, Chief. Every cop in the place swears by him. They don't think he'd do a thing like this. It's his car, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. He keeps it in a public garage near the paper. Says when he went in this morning, a fender and a headlight was smashed up. We picked him up when he took it to a body shop to have it fixed. Four, please. This Leonard kid's hot rod isn't the only one in town, Chief. Half the kids who peddle papers own cars just like it. But not with a smashed fender. Well, somebody might have backed into it in the garage. Kid says he didn't drive it last night. And I believe him. 
sure you're not being influenced by the opinions of the men in the 9th Precinct. Yeah, it takes somebody pretty cold-blooded to run a man down and then beat it without stopping to help. And this kid, he, well, he just isn't cold-blooded. Sixteen-year-olds can do a lot of foolish things when they're frightened. Oh, here we are. All right, Mike, open up for Mr. Garrett. Thanks, Mike. Jimmy Leonard? Yes, sir. My name is Garrett. I'm the district attorney, Jimmy. He'll help you if he can, boy. Just be honest with him. You'd like to know where you were last night. I already told him I was home. Your father says you weren't. Maybe I... Maybe he didn't hear me come in. He was sleeping. I, I, I guess I got up this morning before he was awake. Mm-hmm. The man who was killed was struck down just after 1 a.m. Can you tell us where you were then? No. If you're hiding something to protect yourself, son, you're being very foolish. If you're trying to cover up for somebody else, you're being even more foolish. I don't want to say no more, that's all. I just can't tell you, sir. Why don't you go away? Why don't you leave me alone? Your father says you weren't home all night. Not since you left to sell papers yesterday afternoon. Jimmy, did you ever lend your car to anybody? There's anyone else in the habit of using it. Anybody who might have a duplicate of the ignition key. No. I, w I was the only one who ever drove it. Only assembled the car a month ago. You made it yourself? Yeah, a bunch of us made them. We all chipped in and bought parts so we could get them, you know, whole wholesale. Mm-hmm. Any of the other newsies keep their car in the same garage, right near the paper? Yeah. Rembrandt, I don't know his real name. Guys call him Rembrandt because he goes to an art school at night. And, the, and Frankie Cutter. They're the only ones. Is that all you can tell us? Yeah. It's no use, Harrington. Come on. Lock him in, Mike. Let's get down and get a car. Where to? I want to talk to the other newsies who keep their hot rods at the Midtown Garage. Well, that kid they called Rembrandt was no help, Chief. No, he wasn't. But I still want to see that other newsboy, Frankie Cutter. Did you find out where his stand is? Yeah, 12th and Madison, but he won't be there. Well, why not? He works the corner nights. Somebody else has it the daytime. He lives over this way in Tenement Row, a couple of blocks from the Rimlinger place. I've got to see Rimlinger's wife sooner or later. Maybe I'd better go over there while you're talking to Cutter. Oh, give me the address. Hey, uh, it's written down here. Ground floor flat. Should be the next street to the right. Where good night, he'll probably be sleeping. You want to drop me at the corner? <sighs> Sorry to wake you up, Frankie. Yeah, those kids in the street wake everybody up anyhow. So Jimmy Leonard's in kind of a jam, huh? A bad jam, Frankie. I understand you've got a car just like his. Sure. A bunch of us got him. We all made them together. You garage them in the same place, too. Got to keep them someplace. What a racket. Eight bucks a month garage rent. I could leave it in the street and save the dough, but the cops keep slapping tickets on it. These your keys on the dresser? Yeah. This your pair of dice, too? Oh, yeah. I must have left them out without thinking. Shove them in the top drawer for me, will you? Thanks. My old lady spotted those. She'd scream like an eagle. Frankie, did you happen to see Jimmy Leonard any place last night? No. Why? He say I did? No. Then where was your car during the night? Last night while you were working, I mean. Was it in the garage? Where else? Is it there now? Of course it's there now. Rembrandt's, too. Well, thank you, Frankie. That's all I want to know for now. You don't have to go through the kitchen. Other door leads right into the hallway. <laughs> this is supposed to be a parlor. <laughs> Some laugh, huh? A parlor in this rat trap. Thanks. Well, why don't you stick around for a few minutes? You being the D.A. got the old lady all excited. She went out to get some breakfast rolls. She'll fix some coffee or something. I'm afraid not, Frankie. Well, thank your mother for me. Tell her some other time. You're the boss. So long. So long, Frankie. Oh, hi. Didn't think you'd be back so soon. How did Rimling's wife take it? Hard. 
couple of neighbors with her now. Yeah, she'll be all right, I guess, if she isn't left alone. Two cute kids. Oh, uh, I'd like to stop by the precinct house. Right. The rim lingers need some help from the police fund. He left no insurance, nothing. And he gets killed coming home from work last night. The first week he's had in three months. Three months? Long showman should be busier than that. Plenty of shipping. Yeah, I know. But his wife said he'd had some kind of a beef with the hiring boss, something like that. Anyhow, he was laid off for quite a while, until yesterday. The local union had a meeting yesterday afternoon, and he was elected delegate. I guess that helped him to get working again. Yes, I guess it did. For one night. Harrington, I want you to check the license plates on Jimmy Leonard's car. Compare them with registration. Make sure the motor number is right. Why? Rembrandt and Frankie Cutter have cars exactly like Jimmy's. One of them might have switched parking stalls and license plates. I want to make certain that Jimmy's car is Jimmy's car. His key fit the damaged car, Chief. He drove it out to a repair shop. Well, I can always tell his own car, even for mothers like it. You know that. No, I don't, Harrington. As a matter of fact, at this point, I'm beginning to wonder whether we can tell a case of hit-and-run manslaughter from murder. <laughs> This is David Bryan. Before we continue with Mr. District Attorney in the case of the hot rod killing, here is an important message I'd like you to hear. And now back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A longshoreman had been killed by a hit-and-run hot rod driver. The car had been located, but the 16-year-old owner would neither admit guilt nor speak in his own defense. While Harrington was continuing to check on the death car, I went to see the boy's father. I told him. I told him a hundred times. If I told him once, that that car would get him into trouble. Now, where is he? Behind bars. If I get my hands on him, I'll break his neck. You're talking about your own son, Mr. Leonard. What kind of a father are you? The kind of a father he should have listened to. I've been too easy with him. Just like his mother was. Blood will tell. That's what she'd do, too. Kill a man and run. Never had the guts to face anything. He's a 16-year-old boy, Mr. Leonard. He's alone, and he's frightened. <laughs> he may go to the reformatory for five years. Doesn't that mean anything to you? No. I never should have kept him. She wanted him. She couldn't get him. Not when I got finished with that divorce court. You mean you divorced your wife and you got custody of the boy? Yes. I was too smart for her. You took him away from his mother? I did everything for him. Tried to make something out of him. How could anything like that happen in the name of justice? What do you mean by that crack? You never wanted that boy. I took care of him. Made a home for him. You took him so you could do just what you have done. You took him so you could punish him. So you could use him to revenge yourself on his mother. So you could ruin both their lives and separate them for your own satisfaction. To appease your petty vanity for whatever you think your wife did to you. Get out of here. You're not going to talk to me like that in my own house, even if you are the district attorney. Go on, get out! And when you see that son of mine, tell him I hope they keep him in jail forever. Tell him I hope he rots there. He'll never rot the way he might have rotted here. If your boy is guilty, I know who should really go on trial. A reformatory won't hurt him. Compared to the home you've given him, his life there will be a paradise. Yeah? Excuse me, but is Mr. Garrett here? I'm from his He's office. just leaving. Hello, Miss Miller. There was no phone listed for here, so I came over We can to talk outside. Mr. Leonard was right. I'm just leaving. Well, does he blame you because the boy's in trouble? No, he blames the world for whatever trouble he has inside himself. Well, why did you come after me? Well, as I said, there was no phone listed for Leonard. Some of the policemen at the 9th Precinct were trying to help Jimmy. Yes? One of them found out where he was last night. Where? Well, it's kind of strange. They found out from another newsboy who has a stand near the park district. Saw Jimmy going to the Saverin Plaza Hotel. They checked with the desk clerk. The boy was registered there. Jimmy Leonard registered there at the Saverin Plaza? That's one of the best hotels in town. The desk clerk says he comes there one night every month, always on the 15th of the month. Do you know why? No. 
Have you heard from Harrington? Yes. Registration and serial number match Jimmy's car, all right. Well, where is Harrington now? We said to tell you he was going down to the docks, near where Remlinger was killed. Now, how did you get here? By cab. Good. Take another one going back. Make out an expense voucher. Couldn't I ride back with you? I'm going to stop at the docks and meet Harrington. Well, there's a couple of things I want you to do. Yes, sir. Get the cop that found out Jimmy was registered at the Sovereign Plaza. Tell him to go back to the hotel and check the register for the past year. See if he can find one other particular name besides Jimmy's that appears on the register for the 15th of each month. Get the name, find out who it is and where they come from. Yes, sir. And then go into the civil court's records. About ten years back, I want a transcript of a divorce case. Leonard versus Leonard. Have it all at my office by the time I get back. Yes, sir. See you later. Ah. talking to me? Who do you think I'm talking to? Docks ain't no place for sightseeing. Voice and everything you might get hurt. Why don't you just blow out of here? You Ernie Crow, the hiring boss? Yeah. Say, you must be the guy that's been nosing around here asking the longshoremen questions. Yeah, that's right. You shouldn't do that. Those guys got work to do. So have I. Oh, DA's office, huh? You're working on that hit run case, huh? The guy that got killed, uh, Fred Rimlinger? Yeah, that's right. Well, none of my boys know nothing about that. Poor Fred. I just sent some flowers. Bad thing, the poor guy getting killed like that, leaving a family. I bleed for him. Bleed what? Ice water? You're a pretty fresh guy, ain't you? I've been talking to your men, the few that ain't afraid to talk. Troublemakers? <laughs> What'd they tell you? And you make them kick back 20% of their pay every time you hand them a brass work check at the shape up. And they don't like it. You think you can get one of them to say that in court? Rimlinger didn't like it either. He'd have said so in court. That's why the men elected him delegate. And you gave him a brass check for the first time in three months. He gave him the only night job on the dock. And he got killed on the way home. By a hot rod driven by a crazy kid. You blaming me for that? Something wrong there, Ernie? Yes, Slater. Come here. Right. This flatfoot's been going around the dock stirring up the men, keeping them from working. Making cracks about why Remlinger got killed. Who's this, one of your muscle boys? He's a guard for troublemakers. Now, why don't you hit the road? I think this has gone far enough, gentlemen. Chief, where did you come from? I've been behind those bales for the past two minutes, listening to your very enlightening conversation. You gentlemen have any plans for Mr. Harrington? No. No, of course not, Mr. Garrett, but... Uh... You ought to tell him to be careful about believing what he hears from troublemakers. He shouldn't repeat it. A guy like you has to stand for re-election every once in a while. I know you wouldn't want a taxpayer like me making complaints. I got a lot of connections. I think I'll be able to get by when election day comes without you or your connections. Come on, Hank. Where'd you leave your car? Right over here, under the shed. Where's yours? A couple of blocks down. You can take me to it. Yeah, sure. Which way? Turn right when we reach the street. Now past the ferry slip. That, uh, that hiring boss crawl. I think he knows something about the rimbling and killing. Yes, well, we can't prove it. If only Jimmy Leonard would talk. Or if he'd been able to find a car switch. There was no switch. It was his car. He was the only one who could have been driving it. He took... Look out, Harrington! <laughs> that screwball almost skidded right into us. Yeah, it wasn't his fault. This road. Yeah. Slippery. Oil truck turned over here day before yesterday. They tried to cover it. Yeah, you hear that sand and gravel kicking up under the fenders? Yeah, I hear it. Never mind my car, Harrington. Turn south to the Midtown Garage. What's up? That car that killed Rimlinger must have come through that oil slick and gravel. Yeah? Then the death car will be bound to have some oily sand and gravel stuck under all four fenders. I want to see Rembrandt's car and Frankie Cutter's. Hurry. Anything under that one? Nope. Normal road tires. No sand or oil. Have a look at Cutter's. No. 
Well, this one's okay, too. It's... It... Hey, wait a minute. Let me get this flashlight focused. Well? That's funny. Hey, give me a hand out, will you, Chief? Sure. <clears throat> what did you find? Well, right front fender is clean underneath. But the left front and the two rear fenders are covered with oil and sand. That's what I was looking for. Cutter's car is the one that killed Rimlinger. But Jimmy Lennon's car has the smashed fender and headlight. Because the right front fender and the headlight from this car were taken off and switched for the fender and headlight on Jimmy's. That's why the underside of this fender is clean and the other three aren't. There a phone here? Yeah. I saw the garage man using one in that little office over there. Mr. Garrett, Miss Miller. Oh, Mr. Garrett, Jimmy Leonard's mother's here waiting for you. What? Yes, sir. She just came in on the train from upstate. She heard about his arrest on the radio. Her name's Mrs. Goodrich now. She's remarried. I see. Well, there's something else. Her name has been on the Saverin Plaza Hotel Register the 15th of every month, the same as Jimmy Leonard's. She says he's been meeting her there, so his father wouldn't know. I thought it was something like that. Tell her to wait. Harrington and I are going down to pick up Frankie Cutter. Meanwhile, call Homicide and tell them I want a plain clothes squad to meet me at the River Street Ferry Shed in about a half hour. Tell them to wait. Let's get Cutter. Where are you taking me? I didn't kill the guy, I tell you. Hey, what are we doing down here by the docks? There ain't no police station on River Street. You know what we're doing here, Frankie. You want to tell us who was using your car? Or shall we tell you? You know, don't you? It was Ernie Kroll, wasn't it? Better answer, Frankie. Yeah. He came by the stand. Wanted to know could he borrow the car. So a guy like him, you don't say no. So I give him the keys. What time? Midnight. I was just going to eat. Then he brings the heat back about 2 a.m. Tells me he had an accident. Give me a C-note to have it fixed and keep my trap shut. I thought I'd keep it all, so I glommed onto the fenders and light from Jimmy's car. You want me to drive right on to the dock, Chief? Yes. A lot of guys walking up. Long Charmin finishing their shift. Climb into the back, Frankie. Get on the floor and stay there. Don't worry, mister. I don't want no trouble. Stop here. There's Crow by the hiring shed. Yeah, and that muscle boy Slater... Paying off and taking their kickback. Too money, happy to see us. And they'll see us in a minute. Morgan, fan your squad out along the dock. Nobody gets off this pier. And try to take them in peacefully, Harrington. I don't want any of the workmen to get hurt. I'm with you. All right, Crow. Business is over for the day. But what are you guys doing back here? You're under arrest for the murder of Fred Rimlinger. Slater, come here. Huh? What are you guys trying to pull? We're not trying to pull anything. We have a confession from a newsboy whose car you used, Crow. A, a, a confession? I didn't drive the car. I just borrowed it. Who did drive it? Don't move for a gun, Slater. Stay back, copper. Way back. We got six men on this pier. If you get by me, tell Slater to drop that gun. Hit, drop it, Slater. Do it before they kill us. Uh, all right, all right. Yeah, yeah, we're coming. All right, you men. The law can handle them. They'll get all they deserve. And from now on, you men will get all you deserve. A full day's pay with no kickbacks. Let's go, Harrington. This is David Bryan. I hope you enjoy this case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Now, here is the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. Jimmy Leonard's father tried to regain custody of the boy, but the court reversed its original decision when the true facts were presented. Meanwhile, hiring boss Ernie Kroll and his strong-armed man, Bud Slater, were sentenced to life imprisonment for the murder of Fred Rimlinger. 
Frankie Cutter is awarded the juvenile court until he reaches the age of 21. And now this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the file of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. Thank you.